In this lab, we're going to determine the composition of the solid you see in the test tube by determining its melting or freezing point using a cooling or heating curve. We're going to, we're going to melt this solid and we're going to freeze this solid. We're going to make it go from a solid to a liquid and a liquid to a gas by applying heat to it in a water bath and then cooling it from the water bath and by measuring the temperature of this solid as it goes through the phase changes we're going to determine the phase change temperature as we've learned melting points and or freezing points which by the way is the same temperature okay are physical intensive properties we're going to observe a physical change we're not going to break any bonds here but we're going to be able to come up with a value that'll help us identify this substance, a physical intensive property. Now, if you notice in my test tube, I have a temperature probe, which is stuck embedded into the solid, connected via USB into a computer using a computer program, Logger Pro. We're going to graph in real time the changes in temperature of our solid as we heat it and as we cool it. So if you notice the first objective is to observe a heating and cooling curve. Again, we're gonna take it from a solid to a liquid, pull it out of the hot water bath, and then we're going to see it go from a liquid to a solid. We're gonna skip the gas phase. So as we study heating and cooling curves, we're not going to have uh, a gas phase or a phase change beyond that. It's important to understand that. Okay, so once we do that, take this solid, put it in a hot water bath, and measure the temperatures. We're going to take 10 temperatures per minute over a 40-minute period, and we're going to observe both the melting from the heating curve as we add heat and the cooling curve as we pull it out of the cold, uh, water bath, out of the hot water bath, and let it cool. And we should come up with temperatures that are staying constant. Okay, as we learn phase changes, temperatures don't change because of the conversion of potential to kinetic or kinetic to potential. That's important. So the second part of this, once we have graphed this, once the computer has graphed it in real time, we're going to mark up that data and we're going to determine the composition of the unknown by figuring out what its melting and freezing point temperature is. Again, that's the temperature that stays constant. That's that flat line. That's where the kinetic energy doesn't change because of that. So we're going to get that right from the graph. And once we get the melting and or freezing point, remember they're the same temperature, we're going to go to a list of known values and see where this substance um, is closest to. And then we'll do a percent error, which we all know is measuring the accuracy of our results. So let's go get, let's get to the lab and look as this um, as I do this uh, lab for you in terms of the data we're going to see a um, time lapse of this solid melting and then we'll look at the data after So in our collected graph from the 40 to the 80 minute mark, I continue collecting just to see the cooling part of the curve as the final phase change was returning back to room temperature to make the graph even out and match the other heating curve. So we have just witnessed the collection of data in real time by the Logger Pro program and the computer using the temperature probe and we have now a hard copy that I need you to print out that you would have doing the lab and we should have recognized something that the portion of the graph that goes up here 
represents the heating curve. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the heating curve isn't the best way to observe where the phase change temperature resides and find that nice um, flat line point or that place where the kinetic energy stays the most constant during the phase change. Well, because it's difficult because the heat is being absorbed by the uh, solid in the thermometer in all different places. It's better to watch it cool. So it's hard when we're giving the system a lot of heat and seeing where the temperature stays constant. So that, that's really, really difficult to do, but we can observe it anyway. And if you look carefully, okay, in our curve here, uh, we can see that we're dealing with um, something that's probably below its phase change temperature. If you look here, we have sort of a flat lining here. It's not great because too much energy was being consumed by the thermometer. It couldn't handle the heat. So it looks like here is giving us a what? An indication that a phase change is happening here and then it flies up again. So this little area, this little indentation, you should recognize was our phase change. It wasn't nice to observe. We can't really get a value for where it is the most flatlining or where the kinetic energy is the most constant because there was too much energy being absorbed too quickly by the thermometer. Too much heat there. Just wasn't sensitive enough. Okay, so, but we can still see this is probably going to be the what? the solid, if you remember the video, the phase change, and now a liquid. And then somehow, and we don't really need this part of the graph, we took the what? The solid, or in this case now the liquid, out of the hot water bath and it cooled. So really to get our data here, we should be really focusing on this part of the graph. Notice that we did not measure the temperature of the gas, nor did we boil the liquid, okay? So we don't have the liquid to gas phase change. So we're eliminating that. So all we have is liquid to solid. Now the cooling part, because we pulled it out of the heat and cooling was going from hot to cold, remember our second law of thermodynamics, energy is being dispersed outward. This is a better way to measure, okay, the actual melting point. And we do this in industry, we do this in a chemical lab. We figure out our compositions by looking at melting points. We actually melt it, and then we watch the temperature at which it freezes. Remember, melting and freezing point are the same. So what we're going to do is, looking at our cooling part of a curve, I want you to mark up where the solid, liquid, or gas is in the phase change. So obviously we have a solid and liquid phases, and we have a phase change, and I want you to mark that. And also I want you to mark on your graph is what the actual temperature is. So if you look at this, there's no real mystery here. What do we know? We know that at a phase change, okay, we know that the temperature is going to stay constant because of the conversion of potential uh, and kinetic. So therefore, uh, we're going to look at the most, what, flat line place, and you're going to basically take your, a straight edge and try to find the region where your line is the most flat place where the kinetic energy, which by the way is your temperature, stays the most constant. So find where you think it stays the most constant and then draw a line over to the y-axis, okay, and try to determine what the temperature is. And I want to see that. And I want you to mark that and I want you to say melting point based on your graph. And that's how we are determining the melting point. Now, as you can see, there's not a lot of um, uh, calibration in between these lines here, so you're going to have to guess. In fact, the best way to do this is take the data table, okay? So we're going to mark this graph up. I want solid, liquid, and I want the phase changes marked in all parts of this graph, even on the part where it's not as clear. You still can get some hints here. You still can figure this out. This is kind of reinforcing, reinforcing. This side is reinforcing what this side means. So I want solid, liquid, and gas, and the phase, a solid liquid, there's no gas, and I want the phase changes wherever you think they are for both the heating part of the curve and the cooling part. They should basically tell you very similar information, although one side is certainly more precise. Okay, now that you've done that, okay, to confirm what your estimate melting point is, and remember, I want you to draw 
a straight edge line from where your most flattest position over to the Y and try to guess what you think your uh, value is. The best way to do this is look at our data table. So I printed out the data table which is available for you as well and looking at the data table what we have here is we have remember every 10 seconds there was a temperature given so you can see all the plots and points so what am I looking for well what I would do to find the best melting point or freezing point okay is now that I have my estimate for my graph okay let's whatever you might say try to find that time period okay so it looks like it might be the time period I'm not going to give it away but try to find the time period where you think the temperature stayed the most constant I want you to flip through this data table and I want you to go find me where the values are staying the most constant and how do you do that my friends in chemistry where are the numbers staying the most consistent where are they staying the same okay where they stay the same the most is what your actual melting or freezing point temperature is and I want you to circle them and I want you to just take the page that shows the temperatures that are staying the same the most okay and I want you to just take that page circle them and you attach it behind your graph and the values that you just circled which represent the time and place where you think they're staying the most constant, that's your experimental melting point. Now, once you've done that, the next part of the lab is to figure out what the composition of your substance is by your experimental melting point. So when we look at our uh, conclusion page, the substances that we tested in the lab were one of the four substances. Okay, so what we're going to try to do is, based on your experimental melting or freezing point, all right, you try to identify what the substance in the test tube was. Okay, so clearly we have your experimental melting point that we just determined from our graph and our data table that should go out to one decimal place we're going to see which one it is closest to you're going to name the substance based on which one it's closest to and then the theoretical melting point of course is these known values here and then we'll do a percent error and that essentially is the lab okay what I'd like you to also do in this lab, okay, is there's a data section. And in the data section are basically questions that are not based on our measurements, but they go over uh, parts and all the important parts of a heating and cooling curve. So in the data section, please do that. And also, let's write a very simple conclusion, all right, in this lab. So that's the lab in its essence, and hope that helped.